So good afternoon, um, my name is Sally Thompson for those of you who haven't met me and I'm really glad that you can join us here for this lecture by our visiting Professor Ofa Dahan. Um, um, before we go any further I would like to acknowledge that we are on Wajak Noongabuja and pay my respects to our traditional owners of the land and to the elders past, present and emerging. So it's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Ofa Dahan uh, to the seminar today. You can stare at his face up there or stare at the real item over here. Like it does look like you, yes. <laughs> so Ofa <Okay>. is... <laughs> look, I have to say, as far as I've seen, they're all good days. There's always a bit of a smile there. Um, so Ofa is an Associate Professor at the Zuckerberg Institute for Water Research at Ben Gurion University of the Negev which is located in the Negev Desert in Israel. It's a, quite an extraordinary place if you ever have an opportunity to visit. Ofa's main research activities relate to Vado zone hydrology, to the impact of land use on the quality of ground water, water, the remediation of contaminated soils, and the development of subsurface monitoring technologies, which are a large part of how Ofa and I have come to know each other because we're very excited and interested in the technologies that he's been developing. So Ofer is currently on sabbatical and is here as a visiting fellow. Um, in addition to his academic work, he's also the co-founder of a pretty nifty company, Sensoil Technologies, which spins off some of these monitoring approaches and I'm sure you'll hear more about that today. And as we speak, we are enjoying the knowledge that some of this monitoring technology is sitting on a shipping container on its way from Israel to Western Australia as part of instrumenting our new critical zone observatories. So that's exciting from our point of view. And so in Ofa's lectures today, he's going to explore groundwater protection and agricultural development, conflicts and challenges, and hopefully also some opportunities and solutions. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Ofa. Uh, <coughs> it's fantastic to be here. I don't know if you appreciate it, but this is a piece of heaven if you compare it to other places in the world. So enjoy this heaven, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to do it as much as I can in this place. <coughs> so uh, I'll be speaking about the uh, challenges that we have in uh, agriculture. So I'll try to explain it through uh, this presentation. Of course, there are plenty of students that uh, do all the job. We are only trying to organize this orchestra, but they do all the job. This is only part of them, those that I present their slides. Actually, I prepared nothing from here. They, they do everything. I'm only behind. So uh, to the subject. So water and food. This is what we, we need in order to be on this earth. We appreciate good quality water and we appreciate good quality of food. And this comes through the agriculture, which is obvious to all of you and you've been seeing this before and nothing here is new for you. And you all, need that, you all know that need water in order to create agriculture that can be able to feed, to fill the markets with good food. But this is not by its own. In order to get this colorful food and market, you need fertilizers. There is no such thing, modern agriculture, there is no such thing, ma market, there is no such thing, food, in this modern world without fertilizers. And this has to go together. In order to get that, this triangle has to work. Okay? And, uh, and but, the, uh, in order to understand the, the mechanism or the, or the conflict that I will be talking about soon, we need to understand what is the main water sources that we have and what is the substance through which the agriculture is created. So agriculture is obviously created on the topsoil. But below the topsoil, there is the groundwater. And groundwater is the most important natural water resource all over Earth. I, think, I guess that 99% of the water you are drinking on a daily basis is from groundwater, which means that it comes from a saturated layer which, is, which lies be below the unsaturated zone, which is also contained in it the, the topsoil. And the topsoil is where we conduct all the agriculture, 
we grow whatever we grow, we add the water, we add the fertilizer, we take the natural uh, uh, vegetation, we take the natural animal, and we grow whatever we want here. But this obviously is lies above the groundwater. If we go further on with it, just to know how this uh, groundwater that you are drinking every day is taken, there's wells. Wells penetrate to the subsurface and practically pump the water from below to whatever, for irrigation, for the industry, or for the clean fr fresh water that comes to the, your, your tap. Now, this creates some kind uh, of a paradox because we need to understand the mechanism that groundwater is recharged. So groundwater is recharged usually by water, rainwater, irrigation water, whatever comes from above, infiltrating through the top soil, through the unsaturated zone, reaching the groundwater, and accumulating down there. So this is both the source for fresh groundwater, but it's also a mechanism to carry a uh, pollutant from the topsoil down to the groundwater, no matter whether it is come from industry or it comes from the agriculture. I don't know if you know it, but most of wells shut down all over the world is attributed to agricultural inputs, mostly to nitrate or nitrogen fertilizers. So in Israel, for example, 50% of the water, though it is a very dense place with the industry and agriculture and urban all together, 50% of wells shut down is attributed to ele elevated nitrate that comes from the agriculture. So with that in mind, we need to know that whatever we do on land surface impact the quality of the groundwater below. If we go further by that, we need to know that groundwater pollution forms the main reason for fresh, uh, for fresh water scarcity all over the world. And, and, and more than what we know, we, we like to talk today about climate changes, this is an important aspect, but climate changes impact water resources, as we know, but groundwater pollution is even worse than that because on a daily basis, day by day, or the, over the past 50 years and in the coming future, create more water scarcity than anything else that we are aware of. So if we know that a polluted aquifer is simply a dead aquifer because current remediation strategies are not capable to remediate contaminated aquifer, we need now to start to manage the sources of water and the sources of pollution in order to have them coexist. As if you remember from the first slide, we need the cup of clean water and we need the nice colorful vegetable on the other side. So if we now go back to the main subject, which is agriculture impact on groundwater, there is a, uh, there is a, a graph that, that everyone that learns agriculture learned it on, the, on, the very, on, the, on his first day in the, in, the, in the academy. It's the figure graph of yield over fertilizer application. You increase the fertilizer application, you increase the yield. But this is up to a certain limit. Beyond that certain limit, you can extend fertilizer concentration by orders of magnitude. You will get no more yield until a certain region where it's too much, where you start to get poisoning of the, of the plant. But the point that we want to be is in this point. We want to get the maximum or the optimal yield compared to the fertilizer application. Only that farmers get no idea how to be in this point. So the entire agricultural development all over the world, the consultant, I, I, I grew up, grew up, my academic growing up was in, in the faculty of uh, agriculture in, in uh, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And everybody suggests be in that zone because you don't want to be in that zone because you will lose crop and you need to maximize your crop. So in order to be in that zone, it means that this is excess fertilization. An excess fertilizer will not be utilized by the plant because the plant will not take more than that, which means that it will go down. Now, if you travel over the world and you fly above, unless if you live in, in Australia and you, you see some remote natural area, all over Europe, most of the US, major portion of South America, this is the landscape which means that the groundwater which is located below is located under agricultural field. Now, we know that there is no such thing agriculture without fertilizers. Now, here comes the coexistence between. And if we look, this is one place in Israel, but it is typical to the entire world. Levels of con con concentration of nitrate over time 
is rising in aquifers all over the world just because of leachates going leaving out the fields, going down to the groundwater. Now this is typical to all over. This is the reason, the main reason for whales shut down all over the world, unless you live here. So agriculture, fertilizer, and excess fertilizers, not only for the groundwater, because by the end groundwater is connected to the, to the, to the surface water, whether it is the rivers or the stream channel or even the Great Barrier. When you, when you walk out and you see a field, uh, you see a stream with uh, green water, usually the green water, look around, you will see an agricultural field which is uh, fertilized, and this is what happens, uh, happens on, on the other side. So now we know that groundwater protection and agricultural de development, which we need both, create some kind of conflict. And conflict needs to be managed. This is something that we don't know. We do not do until now. We have agricultural de departments that study how to develop agriculture. We have water resources, uh, water management department, <coughs> then try to manage water. And in between these two, sometimes, and until recently, there was no interaction. Conferences for agriculture, conferences for water. They did not talk to each other because they didn't know how to manage it. So how do we control now uh, nitrate pollution? Controlling nitrate pollution is a headache for all governments all over the world. And many countries, like in Europe, they have the European directives. In the, U in the US, there are many, many uh, local uh, uh, regulations about how to manage uh, nitrogen, nitrate pollution. For example, uh, Germany paid 4 billion euros fines for the EU because they didn't stand for, their farmers didn't stand for the European directives. So what they did, they tried to limit the, uh, pot the possible agricultural uh, uh, implementation of fertilizer in agriculture and what they got that. Berlin was blocked for four days with, with tractors because farmers uh, need, need to provide food but with restriction and no tools to, to manage these restrictions, they have no way to provide this food. And this is the consequence. So either we manage or we get that. So again, going back to this guy who needs to manage the soil, manage, need to manage the fertilizer, need to prevent leaching down, he got a big problem. And the only way to solve that is uh, try to monitor it. So what do we do today to monitor the soil? So commonly we are using lysimeter, suction lysimeters that enable to suck, to, to, to get the liquid sample from the soil. We take soil sample, we analyze that, and get some kind of information once in a while, once in a season, before the season, after the season, maybe twice. If you are a good farmer, maybe twice in a season. But this is a snapshot in time, doesn't give us the real conditions. Something happened here? Okay. Another way is to look at the leaves, which we are looking a lot today, uh, and tell us something about how healthy is the plant. Or today, which is very common, going up with drones, take pictures and scan uh, spectral analysis of the field and get whatever we can get on the field. But all these do not give us information about the fertilizers in the soil. It will give us only if this plant is happy. It wouldn't give us anything about the excess. So if you want something that will give us about the excess and not just how happy is the plant, we need to go into the soil. And into the soil with real management of the soil. So we want to prevent uh, the leaching from top to down. We know water must go down. And we want to know it long before it turns into contaminated water. So one approach, if you want to save the aquifer, one approach is collecting soil samples. This is something we do a lot. Every soil scientist, everyone which deals with agriculture did it in the past, collect soil samples, analyze them, make profile, and say something about the soil. But this is a snapshot in time. It doesn't tell anything about the dynamics of the process. If we go to the hydrological section, people who studied hydrology in school, and they have uh, uh, groundwater monitor, monitoring uh, wells. These provide only late information. 
which means that the pollution already crossed the unsaturated zone, accumulated in groundwater, and now we can cry what have we done to the groundwater before, be, below. Which means that if we want to solve that, we must be able to have something that will monitor continuously the subsurface. Continuously, and one, one, one option is monitoring the unsaturated zone, something that will sit in the unsaturated zone from land surface to the water table. This is something that we are going to do also here in, 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 in Australia soon. Every section like that measure continuously the quality and the quantity of the water that moves down. And it has some water content sensor, it has a gas sampling port, it has a, a, a water collection samples. All this can go up to the surface and tell us something about the quality of the water moving down. This system is already working for, for 20 years already from the beginning. It has been installed all over the world and we have, we have them in variety of places, okay? I, I don't want to go deep into that, but some of it is going, is, it was used for understanding land use impact on groundwater quality in variety of projects. Over 140 systems were installed over, all over the world. To learn about flood water infiltration, if you live in arid zone, most of the groundwater that you get there is not from the rain. It's from the flood that run in the stream channel once in a while. So we've been using that. To learn about uh, reservoirs, uh, water infiltration below the reservoir, to learn about landfill leachets, and I saw huge landfills nearby here, how the leachets from the landfill move down. This is our version for Chinese dragon that goes into the landfill. This is practically in the landfill. You see the material, this is waste. And remediation of contaminated site. All this is already there, and we are now about to install around Australia in five locations through the critical zone uh, uh, <coughs> project. And uh, I will give you now results from one project done with this system and we can discuss later on the meaning of that, okay? So here is a project that one of, out of many projects where we're using this system in order to measure the impact of agriculture on groundwater. So here we wanted to go to something which is perceived clean and nice and modern organic farming. So when you go out to the supermarket, usually you will see a bucket of uh, organic tomato and a bad bucket of ordinary tomato. And this is expensive but good, but this is less expensive and maybe less good. And your tendency is to think that organic is, is good, okay? Good for Mother Earth and good for my stomach. So we went to compare this, uh, this field and I will go straight into the results. Here a comparison between the two. Uh, these are not experimental. These are in a real, with real farmers in a commercial, commercial field where they grow cherry tomatoes. Here is the irrigation regime in the organic farm. At the beginning, establishment irrigation, and then you irrigate continuously. Here is the conventional, again, it's the, uh, establishment irrigation, rises up a little bit and, end in, in, uh, and stop in the end. They both use the exact same amount of water for the season. Actually, I have the same amount of tomatoes by the end. Okay, so practically it's the same, okay? The organic use organic matter like compost as the main source of, uh, of uh, nitrogen, while the conventional use most of it as liquid fertilizer, artificial fertilizer, industrial one. But they use the same level of nitrogen per area, which practically the same amount of water and the same amount of nitrogen. So it's supposed to be the same. So here are the concentrations. Here we can take a sample from the entire unsaturated zone once in a while. Once here, you can see every three to four weeks, a student went over, took a sample, got to the lab, made the analysis, and we have a, a, a set of profile. And you can see that the, con the conventional, we have a very high concentration in the topsoil. This is depth in meters, and this is concentration. Very high in the topsoil, which is fantastic. This is the roots. This is where this is uh, uh, the fertilizer for the plant and relatively low concentration below, which this is what we want. We want the, all, the, all the nitrogen to go to the plant. And here is the organic. You see relatively low concentration in the root zone 
and very high concentration below. This is from very old because now we have a flat line goes from here all the way down. This was from the beginning. Which means that we have very high concentration of nitrate below the root zone, far from the capabilities of the plant to take it out. Why is that? Organic need to implement all the compost in the soil before plantation. Then, or conventional, will add fertilizer only upon the demand of the plant. No farmer will spend fertilizer while the plant is that size because there's no one to utilize it. On the other hand, when you implement water on compost, you will get all the leachate down. So there is a reason for that. For practically, next time you go to buy organic tomato, think twice about it because it's polluting the groundwater below 40 times or 50 times, depends how you count it, more than any uh, any other uh, conventional uh, farming. But this is not the end of the story. But what I showed now is kind of history almost. Because it still doesn't, not able to give the farmer real time information about what's going on this in the soil. It's only too late for him. I mean, we, some, some funky scientist came and measured and said, oh, you've been using too much fertilizer. What can he do with it? We need to provide the farmer with something that can sit in the ground and tell him all the time what he got there in order to help him to be in this point and not lose crop and not, so if you're here, you lose crop. If you're here, you pollute groundwater, you lose water. So in order to be here, we need to have something that will measure continuously. And this is the approach. We want real time measurement in the route or across the profile of the route that will tell us all the time the condition in the ground. So you will be able to manage the fertilization, the fertilizer application, according to what's in the soil. So our, there, there are many, many ways to measure nitrate. We wanted to go to something which is very robust. On the other hand, complex is through UV, uh, UV analysis, UV absorption spectroscopy. And uh, nitrogen absorb you, uh, light in, in the UV, UV range, but it also has a, a major problem since if you look at the, at the absorption uh, spectroscopy, uh, uh, we will see that we have two ranges of absorption, one in the range of 230, 240, and one in the range of the 300, only that in the soil, water is always with organic matter. You've been irrigating the pot at home, fresh, clean water, what do you get below? Yellow water. Yellow water, this is organic matter, humic, humic acid and, and other stuff that makes the yellow water yellow. If you have only a little bit of organic carbon in the water, then the whole absorption uh, 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 spectral uh, uh, distribution here is masked by the organic matter, which makes it a problem. So after seven years of trials and error and trials and error, and we finally cracked it out and manage to get that out of the entire absorption. And I'll show, without getting into the nuts and bolts of, of that, I will show you directly um, the outcome. So here is an experiment which we use that system with that analytical method. Well, we have uh, irrigated the water, the, the soil, with, uh, uh, <coughs> once with uh, with a pulse of, of fertilizers, and then with fresh water. And what we get is a classic breakthrough curve. This is concentration in the soil. This is over time measured in this point in the soil, okay? This is the concentration as by taking a liquid sample to the laboratory. No farmer will do that on a daily basis, okay? Uh, and this is another one. And this is what we could get with the instrument, hourly measurement we can do in any resolution, which measure digitally and can send information directly out to the cell phone of the farmer or directly to the fertilization machine. We can see patterns that never seen before, these, these uh, fluctuations, which are, at the beginning we thought it's some kind of artifact, but I will show you soon enough that it's not an artifact, it's real. This is the plant demand, the leaching, leaching and plant demand all the time. So now we have a proof of concept, and we understood that we cracked the problem of how to measure in the soil continuously the nitrate, 
Okay? From here, we went to a development stage. We had some lysimeters. We measure in different soil. The red is the laboratory analysis, and the black is the dots from the sensor. A different soil with organic matter, with compost. Then we went to check it in live lysimeter for a control certification, and then to the field. I would like to take you directly to the field. Here, we joined uh, an experiment done by the best agricultural scientist in Israel about growing tomato in harsh conditions and blah, 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 blah. All we wanted was to join this experiment in order to measure what's under the root or in the root while, while they run their own experiment, whatever they want to measure, the plant type, the quality of the water, whatever they wanted to do there, do. We will just measure under. And here are the results. What you see here is concentration of nitrate into depth 20, which is the root zone, 20 to 40, the root zone. There is also a 40. I mean, there will be too much data here. And 60, which is below the root zone. 60 is below the root zone for this tomato. And what you see here, look at the range of concentration. It looks, this is for the entire period from the beginning of the, not the beginning, we came a little bit later, but through the growing, through the growing season. What you see here is between 150 to 220, this is the maximum that the plant can absorb. He will not get more yield if you will have higher concentration, which means all that, which you consider, you know what's the concentration for drinking water? 50, 40, depending which country you are. If you're in Switzerland, it's 10. Okay, De depend where you are. But all that is just a waste. More than that, this means the, the green one means that you are already below the root zone, which means it is going directly to the groundwater in concentration, reaching 800 or 1,000 milligram per liter. Okay. So this is direct poison into the groundwater. So all that is a waste for the farmer on fertilizer that he applied and didn't use. And it's a waste from the other side that we are losing, we are creating groundwater pollution by that. And this is not done by dumb uh, uh, agri farmers, okay? No farmer is dumb, dumb. but, but someone, people who, who pr pretend to know what they are doing. And if we looked at that before, we see, we see a lot of noise, okay? It seems like noise, but it's not noise. Here is only the green one that you saw before. This is the daily fluctuation, which means the plant consumption on a daily base. So now we can tell exactly how much the plant was taking and how much was leached down. And this is by the end of the season when they applied only water to leach the soil as preparation for the next some in the next, uh, next plantation. So we have a proof of concept, but uh, from agronomical point of view, the challenge is to be able to control the fertilizer application according to what we measure. So on one hand, we have the capability to measure. This is a proof shown before. Now we want to see if we are able to control the fertigation on the basis of real time adjustment of the soil nutrient concentration according to the plant demand. So the plant is there, is telling you I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, I'm dry, no, I have too much, give me exactly what you want. As you will feed your baby. If he's not crying, you probably won't feed them. Okay? If he's crying, this is time for a snack or a slap or something else. You need to treat him. Okay? This is, this is something you need to do to do there. So with that, we went to another experiment. This is in the Arava Desert. Daily temperature in summer is above 45. Uh, usually, we walk at night in this place, but the bell pepper love these temperatures. They grow fantastically on this temperature. This is the control panel for this monster that is this system that I will show you later on. We want to make it something smaller, and we measure under this field. Okay. So the idea is to have continuous measurement of what's happening in the soil below these plants. <coughs> Analyze it from the analysis, get, go back to the fertilization system, and feed, feed the system on a regular basis. 
So now what I show you is something which is, looks very messy. A lot of information there is here, but this is just the beginning. I will go, I will just I try to highlight a few things from here, okay? I know it's a lot of information. What we see here, the red, green, and blue, is the concentration of nitrate in three different depths. 20, 40, the 20 and 40 is the main section of the wood zone, and 60, which is the green, the blue, sorry, it's upside down, and 60, which is below the wood zone, okay? What we see here is the implementation of fertilizer to the plant. Here, here this is the normal fertilization, then cut to half, then halt, then cut to quarter, and we play with it all around. Down below, we see changes in water content in the three depth, because water content is also, or water is also part of, of that, and this is the water application. So what we are trying to do is by controlling the water application and controlling the fertilizer application to control the concentration in the soil. Now you see it's very messy because this was the first experiment where we wanted first to see the dynamics. If we change the water or we change the, the, the fertilizer application, what's going to happen down below? Okay? So from here I'll go to a few sections. Here you can see well, when we stop the fertilization, this is a gap in fertilization, immediately we get a reduction in concentration in all three depths. Proof of concept. We can now reduce the concentration to what we want. Then we said, okay, let's give only halfway. Halfway, we start to get rise again. Well, half is not enough. Half is, is still too much because we get 600 milligram of, of per liter concentration. And then we made few more games all along, okay? I will try to go straight to the next points. So here is an example. Here, we reduce the fertilization to nothing. And we got the concentration that we want. We wanted to stabilize it on the range between 200 to 300. Though 150 is enough, but we didn't want to create any damage to the plant while we are still don't know anything about it. It's the first experiment, and we don't know, want that by the end of the experiment, people will tell us, look, about your, look at your field is dead, and our field is happy. So we want it to be a little bit above the limit. So immediately here, after that halt, and we saw that the concentration starting to go down too much, we went to half amount. Half amount is not enough, because uh, it's too much, still too much, because we are still rising up to 600. So this is just a proof of concept that we can start to manage, okay? Here is another experiment that we wanted to stabilize the concentration in 40 centimeters, which is the, the plant are already growing up. This is a large plant. We want it to be the red one above 100 and the blue one and, the, and the, the green one also high. But this is not enough. So you see one attempt to rise, and another attempt to rise to stabilize. So we are trying now to go up and down and up, the, up down, and now we are working on making an algorithm which will read this information and adapt these to what's supposed to be uh, below. All the data, once again, what we showed before, if you're looking at all the data and the general concept, we can see all that is a waste of money for the farmer. So if 10 years ago the farmer said in local language, I don't care for how much it costs me the fertilizer, I have enough, urea is very cheap, I can implement as much as I want because I need to feed the market with a lot of fruit, he cannot say any more that because now the fertilizer, nitrogen fertilizer, is about six times more than it, what it was six years ago or seven years ago, okay? So now it already start to hurt his pocket. But, so this is excess fertilizer, but if we are under, we can tell immediately. Before the drones above that will come a few days later, we say, ah, this area is a little bit, doesn't get enough <coughs> nutrient. We can tell it in real time, in real time means hourly resolution. Go and implement the fertilizer now before you get damage to the plant. So we can control the excess, and we all can also control 
the shortage. Okay? So now we have a big challenge. If I go back, you saw before these two like uh, telephone boxes outside, which was the system. No farmers will do that. It costs thousands of dollars. Okay? We want our aim is to be able to have something that will move from this monster robot. We already have the third generation to Coca-Cola size can device that will cost no more than hundred dollars, American hundred dollars, let's say two hundred dollars uh, Australian do dollars. That every farmer can implement in the ground and or maybe even not implement in the ground. A company will implement and give them direct information from outside, you have too much, you have less, or will automatically uh, 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 operate the fertilization system. So we are already there. There is a new company that was established on that, that technology. Uh, we are now moving into the fields with the new generation, which that size in low cost. Uh, we are already monitoring in commercial fields and uh, the idea is that we measure in the field, and from the field we will be able to tell the farmer or do it for him what he needs to do inside. And uh, this is where we are aiming to, to give the farmers real-time indication what's there. He will manage better his inputs, manage better his outputs, which will be the cash by the end of the season, and the water division will have a uh, Better, better feeling about what's going down. And with that, I like to, uh, to end up. So what are the challenges? Conceptually, I think that if we will be able to extend the monitoring, the monitoring zone from the groundwater to the unsaturated zone will make a big change because EPA in the US, the European Directive, I don't know how it is in Australia, but every, every, every gas station in Israel or in Europe, I don't know how it is in Australia, must have monitoring wells around it in order to monitor if there is groundwater contamination. But once we have groundwater contamination, it's already too late. So we must be able to extend it to the place where the action happens before it's already down below. So this is one conceptual challenge which I think requires a change in mind setting of decision maker to understand that it's possible to measure that zone. The other challenge is more practical. We want to be able to make real-time continuous monitoring of nutrients, nutrient in the soil uh, as a requirement for fertilization. Today, the entire fertilization of the agriculture in the world is done either on the basis of pre-planned uh, tables or schedules or whatever is known from centuries be before. We want to make it to make it uh, happen that the farmer will know what's in the soil before he implements the fertilizers. And the last one is technological. We have to be able to develop more and more and more technologies for the unsaturated zone. Something that will give not only for rich scientists that get funds from whoever knows millions of dollars and euros to measure something in the soil. We want to be able to develop something which will be affordable for every farmer or every gas station or every, every uh, uh, potential co a, a, a plant or factory with potential contamination from groundwater. So it will be uh, ready inside. So what we know is that conflict creates challenges wherever the conflict is. But we know, everybody knows that Challenges are solvable if we invest enough effort in it. And this is goes for all of us. This is my, my only message. And by this, I think I'm, yeah, almost on time. All right? Thank you. All over. All over. 
This was tested in places where we could use cheap fertilizer, the, those that are so soluble, and can be used, and uh, we can manage the water and the fertilizer together, just for proof of concept. But if you have wheat that grows all over, maybe you shouldn't use anymore the same urea that you've been using for years. Maybe you should go for something. Maybe now the fertilization company will start to compete themselves, between themselves, who is releasing the fertilizer to the soil in a way that will not be wasted down be below. Maybe if you will implement uh, the fertilizer before the rain, after the rain, maybe you will need to implement it in a certain way that will keep it more in the root zone. But now you will have the capability to know you lost all the fertilizer of the last year, or maybe you should use a different fertilizer, something that will is, is more uh, available for the plant for a longer period. So it can go for all over, I, I, I think. But, but I'm not saying that we are there yet, but it requires uh, effort, as we said. We have challenges <coughs> we have to, to face, but we have the capability to do that. Yeah, excellent presentation, very Thank colorful. You. Thank you for that. Um, Australia, Western Australia, more than 60% of the soil is sandy soil, mm -hmm. called simply sand. No water retention, no nitrate retention. Mm -hmm. That's number two. Number three is, you just mentioned cost of the nitrogen fertilizer is hitting the roof. So the focus in Australia is, I know groundwater pollution is a serious issue, more in the case of New Zealand, not in Australia, because New Zealand uses a lot of groundwater sources. The focus in Australia is increasing the nitrogen use efficiency, what we call NUE. Now for that, there is a strong evidence when you have a carbon in the fertilizer that will increase the nutrient use efficiency. Yeah. That means you can reduce that nitrogen input. Now, there has been a lot of interest going on. Biochar, for example. Mm -hmm. Put nitrogen into the biochar. If you go to China, they all call it carbon fertilizer. They don't call it organic fertilizer, a carbon fertilizer. Mm -hmm. My question to you is whether Israel is getting into that kind of direction, as you said, kind of slow release, mm -hmm. more efficient, carbon-based fertilizer, so that you can reduce the nitrogen input. Yes. Uh, I'll start from the beginning where you said that uh, we, we've been moving here, everything is sand, 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 that have zero, almost, I mean, almost lo low carbon, there's not much carbon in the soil, especially if you go a little bit below the root zone, or you go north and there's no carbon in the soil to retain it. So what I showed is in very, the results I showed are in very sandy soil. It's not soil, it's sand. Okay, sand, quartz, sand, very similar to what you got here in the Arava and in the other place. And the only way to make it fertile is by adding compost to the soil, a lot of compost, in order to make it, to make, it, to make the retention both of the water and the fertilizer higher. Here, you, for example, you see this guy, which is the conventional, is using organic matter just for soil amendment. And then this in this part is the fertilizer that is used as fertilizer for the plant, okay? So adding carbon is very, very important. Now, I'm not sure you can add carbon to these millions of kilo square kilometers you have around here, but you already need to, have to implement fertilizers. Now, if, you, if the regulation would come and say to the, these companies, listen, you cannot use any more urea in this place. Now, there will be some kind of a, a race which company will provide you with a fertilizer, which would be either slow release, some kind of a complex, organic complex that will have the fertilizer inside and release it. This is already something, a new issue that you need to come in, need to tackle. I'm not an expert in that. 
but it's possible. Adding carbon source to the soil is, is, uh, is almost standard for every soil in Israel. And I know the Israeli uh, fertilizer companies, there are a few of them, especially those that were using minerals from the Dead Sea and from other uh, 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 mined mineral. They know that the, the, the regulator is on their neck and they are, they are doing the, the best effort they can for now, maybe not the best, but enough to show that they, they produce fertilizer which are slow release. So it goes back to what you asked before. So soil, organic matter, sand, they got no retention, especially in sand, you must keep the, if, if you don't use something that stays in the ground, as I showed before, 80% of your of nutrient will just go down. In, it was in, in, the, <coughs> in, that ex, in that example here. here. This is what the plant need. This is what they've been using in order to keep it, to, to keep it growing. Yeah, this question always rise up. Uh, as you know, try to bring, try to bring a water sample to the laboratory and ask them, okay, tell me what's inside. They will use 10 huge different machines in order to, to do that. So at the beginning, it must be very tailored. We are now developing on the basis of this system. Also, we already have it for ammonium. So we will be able to have the ammonium. We have first steps for, uh, for phosphate, but phosphate is very tricky in the soil because there's no such thing phosphate in the soil. It always depends on the pH. It's always different and it, it's not easy to analyze it because it will behave differently. There is no single probe in the world or single machine in the world that can analyze everything. So for example, when we are going under dairy farms, we'll be looking for hormones estrogen and uh, estradiol, all these hormones, there's no machine that can sample it, but with, at the same time, with the same instrument, we are going under gas stations and we are measuring the fuel components and the, and the, and the isotopic composition of the fuel components in order to see the degradation. Or in other place, we are looking for explosives. So for now, what I thought well, in my mind was the most a, a urgent problem was the issue of the nitrate. Because pollution from different kind exists all over, but here it is heavy metal, and here it is perchlorite, and here this is gasoline, but what is the common to the entire world is the nitrate. And I deliberately focus on the nitrate. Now I can move to other things. <laughs> We measure water content, but the sensor uh, is not actually measuring uh, in the soil. The sensor actually extracts water, the pore water, and measure in the pore water. So we are actually not measuring what is absorbed, just what is mobile in the water. For example, if you measure, you go for ammonium, half of the ammonium will be absorbed and part of it will be moving with the water. So practically we are, uh, sucking liquid from the soil, very small, tiny quantities, like few milliliters in an hour or so, uh, and measure in that water continuously. Okay, this is one part. So if you have very low water content, your chances to measure is very, very low. On the other hand, if you have very, very low water content, nothing is moving there. And it's less of an issue, okay, an environmental issue. Also, if it is from an agri agricultural point of view, if the water content is very low because in, you are in between seasons and nobody is irrigating and nothing is growing there, it's also less of an issue. It comes to an issue when either you have rain event, then you have higher water content. Not saturation, I'm talking about 10% water content or what have you had here. Uh, in this uh, experiment, this was here. 
here. You can see the water content. 8% less than 10% here, deeper, it's 9% or 10% water content, volumetric, okay? Which gravimetrically, it's a two-third of it. So it's very sandy soil, goes back to your question, very sandy soil, very low retention. But when it's active under irrigated field, we can measure. Yeah, I have, I have two months more to stay here. <laughs> Just curious, I'm um, really interested in the study you did between the conventional and the organic farm. Wondering if you've looked at anything where um, biologically fixed nitrogen and whether that actually, how much that leaches into the soil. I'm not a biologist. Actually, the lowest grade I had in my bachelor was in biology, <laughs> microbiology. But I deal with microbiology all the time, so I have a colleague that works with me on, on these things that I don't know on the other side. <clears throat> uh, we haven't gone to deep into the, the process, okay, the biological process. We only measured actually below the biological zone. If we go back to here, the biologically active zone, these are, this is the first soil, the first one meter of the soil is the biologically active area. If you go deep here, this is already the biological potential below one and a half meter is already very, very low. So we are only looking at the nitrate and we all, all through the isotopic, I mean, I'm, I'm showing only, there are a few papers published on that and I'm showing only just, you know, highlight. But if you're looking at the isotopic composition of the material, we see that from there, this point down, there's no change in isotopic composition, which means there's no any more degradation activities, uh, the nitrate is fixed and this is an oxidated zone, it will not, there will be, be no denitrification anymore. Uh, the biological part that is responsible for that, we are not sure about, but it's obvious for us that if you take sand and pour and mix it with, 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 uh, with, uh, with compost, and you add water, and if it's sandy soil, immediately you get yellow, yellow water below. And this yellow water is what everything was taken out from this compost. So, of course, there are biological issues, but I was frustrated, uh, and I stopped a little bit working on that, first, because I'm not a microbiologist, and second, it took us three years to publish this, because every journal that we went and we say organic matter, organic agriculture is a little bit problematic, they throw us out of the window without even reviewing, saying that it's like saying there's no God. So it was a little bit of a problem. But of course, there are, there are many issues into it, but we haven't gone deep into it, but there's surely a whole array of research around, er, around it. But I already moved to remediation of contaminated <laughs> soil from there. I actually meant it more in terms of you have the conventional, the organic, if you've had a look at instead of adding nitrogen that way, using something like a legume that will naturally fix the nitrogen into the soil, and how is that sort of, because my thought would be that would be slightly more regulated or self-regulated, that it wouldn't produce way more um, nitrate than it needs. I was curious whether you've actually looked at it differently, that was. Crop, crop switching is sure. standard in Israel. It's done all the time. Some crops are, are allowed only once every four years. Some every two years you have to change and you have to put legumes in order to fix nitrogen. But what we see is that a good rain event will wipe out the nitrogen pool from the topsoil if it is sandy soil. So it's, it's useless in, in many ways because the nitrogen, especially if it's already nitrate, and if it's sandy soil, it's nitrate almost immediately, okay, will be washed out pretty, pretty fast. So all these theories about changing and, and, and you, need, you need to make sure that the nit nitrogen is there because there was one side that we forgot to close the, well not forgot, the, the irrigation system for a night. By the next night it was all washed. Next morning it was all washed. The water concentration dropped down to almost zero. And with no new uh, fertilizers, the plant would start Showing down. 